there were only 27 non-Caucasian students on campus at that time out of about a population of 2,000 and so. Today they call that uh, cultural shock because I had never gone to school with a majority of uh, Caucasian students. Not only was there racism, there was sexism. For me, it was absolutely devastating. Forget We could not get into a sorority or a fraternity. Even the Jewish students had to form their own uh, Jewish uh, fraternity, the males did. That's how we felt on that campus, outside of the norm. We had a chaplain, his last name was Yudi, he was from uh, Australia, and uh, he was very interested in civil rights, things like that, but uh, I believe he was the person who basically uh, started the idea of bringing uh, Martin Luther King to campus. He went to school with him. Yeah. They were Boston graduates. Boston, Boston University. University. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. But uh, there, there was uh, it, there was a lot of discussion. That not everyone was in favor of having Martin Luther King come to Ada <laughs> or come to Ohio Northern, uh, especially worried about security and. Uh, there were differing views at that time, as you would expect, about the type of work that Martin Luther King was doing. There were a lot of threats made against Dr. King and the president, Dr. Sam Myers, in terms of don't bring him you know, to the campus because this will happen and that will happen. Uh, very few people of a minority status of any type were here on campus. And uh, I think that uh, UD was concerned about that. Even like walking down the street in Ada, there weren't any uh, black people that lived. It was an Egyptian family that lived there, but there weren't what they considered the ne Negroes. I think that was a, a driving force at that period of time here at the university. To stir the pot a little bit? Stirred the pot quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> I think he felt that that was the role of the chaplain, the role of a godly man, uh, like Jesus, Jesus didn't come, he said, uh, for those that were well, he came for those that were sick, and so therefore he stirred the pot, you know, quite a bit. Just a little over an hour ago, I was stamping up and down Cleveland Airport, waiting for Dr. King, who was delayed with car trouble. We have made the trip as fast as possible. I would suggest that at Ohio Northern University today, we fly the hammer of justice, Dr. King. Uh, the plane was late. UD picked him up and drove him from the airport uh, here to campus, and the uh, Taft was quite filled. Uh, Taft had a running track on the second floor. Was open and that's where I sat up there to get a good overview. And I had dressed up and I remember I had on a white wool blazer and uh, a tattersall blouse and I think I had on, uh, uh, well no my skirt was white too and you know because we didn't dress up very often and so we were dressing up. We wanted to look promising and, and so we sat up front and we were pretty much we had a front seats. I must uh, join Dr. Yudi in expressing our regrets for being late uh, but we did have some car trouble in Cleveland and after we landed here we had to make it very quickly. And of course Martin Luther King opened the with probably the most memorable statement. <laughs> he pointed out that uh, Udi was driving very fast because he realized there were a lot of people waiting to hear him. And uh, he said we were uh, going at a very high rate of speed. And uh, ever and again, Dr. Udi's son would remind him that he should slow up. He said, and I uh, uh, reminded uh, Chaplain Udi that I would rather be Martin Luther King late and the late Martin Luther King. My heart uh, pounded and you know when he came out because you know he wasn't a very big man 
but uh, but he was big you know he was far bigger than his stature and 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 he talked and and you looked around the room and the thing that was really thrilling was that it was packed there wasn't there wasn't elbow room there just wasn't room it's always a rich and rewarding experience to, to take a brief break from, from the day-to-day -day -to -day demands of our struggle for freedom and human dignity and discuss the issues involved in that struggle with college and university students and concern friends of goodwill all over our nation and all over the world. I, I happen, happen to, to feel, feel that, that dialogue is mighty good and something that we constantly need and it's always a great tragedy. It's a great tragedy when a society seeks to live in a monologue rather than in a dialogue. I, I describe his talk as uh, electric. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Everybody was uh, just really taken by what he said. I mean, you saw him on the news. You knew of him. I mean, the fact that, again, as I said before, he was here. You could see him. It seemed like everybody on campus attended and was sitting there and listened to every word you know, that proceeded out of his mouth as though it was gospel. In some states, particularly in the Black Belt counties in the South, the murder of a Negro or white civil rights worker still a popular pastime. The, the emphasis back then was civil rights, and that's why he was here. It was to uh, nonviolent civil rights. But physical violence is not the only violence that can be inflicted on a person. That is another kind of murder that can be inflicted. And that's a kind of psychological and spiritual murder. He gave a litany of where they have, the civil rights have been and the progress they've made. But then he also said, we, we're not done. We've got all this progress to make yet. So, you know, it's, it's good and it's bad, but we're, we still have more to accomplish. And he was gone within about two months. You know, just like Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy, you know, they were popularists. Uh, they would have made a difference, I think, in this country. And so, um, they were assassinated. You know, it's just like, you know, Abraham Lincoln, he was assassinated really for what he did, you know, for what he stood up and did. And, and uh, that's, you know, kind of the definition of a martyr. They, you stand up and you die for what you believe. So he became a martyr. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair a stone of hope we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you.